Has this ever happened to you that you've planned some time off, time to get away, to rest? You know you've been hustling for a while, so you plan a vacation or even a staycation, but you just have this idea that you need some time away to just rest and restore and get yourself back on track. And then when it happens, you get sick. <laughs> I have had this happen more than once in my life as well as some other things. And all of it is a big, big red flag that tells you that your life is definitely not in balance. And if you want to learn a little bit more about how self-care can play a role in getting you back in balance, then keep listening. Welcome back. All right. So we've been talking about self-care. I hope that you've downloaded my free self-care cheat sheet. If you haven't, Go to the notes for this podcast. You can click on the link in the notes or go to learntoloveyourstory.com and it's my freebie right on my front homepage. So download for yourself that lovely cheat sheet that helps you match where you need self-care in your life, chemically, where your body is telling you you need some, some self-care in your life. And then it matches that over to the right kind of self-care that will give you back those chemicals. So remember last week, if you haven't listened to that podcast, you'll want to head over. But I broke down self-care internally into four separate categories. So instead of like, what do you want to do for self-care? There's 5 billion things to do. Truth be told, there's four different things that are getting generated. So you really can be very closely matched to here's my deficit. This is the kind of self-care I need. Here's my deficit. This is the kind of self-care. So get that cheat sheet, but be sure that you're heading over to learn to love your or into the notes to get your cheat sheet. But today, what I want to talk about is this idea of balance. And I'm actually not so sure that balance is the word that I want to use for this anymore. So I'll be a little provocative. I'll just throw that out there right in the beginning because balance implies that that there's a pie here that there's like only so much to go around which with your energy is true but not all kinds of self-care are equal and not all lives that are balanced or what we want when we feel in alignment mean that we're at a, you know, if I have this much work, I have this much self. So we're going to take a look at how do you figure this out for yourself? Because I can't tell you the number of times I am in an office with a client or on a call with a client. And the idea of, I know I don't have my life in balance comes up, but one of the biggest red flags of this and one that I have myself just fantastically displayed in my lifetime is when you set time up to, to have off, to help yourself. And what happens is it, you know, either gets filled up with things that you need to be doing. And so you don't get rested or you get sick <laughs> because by the time you get there, your body really is that depleted. And it's just like, and we're done. So how do we know when our life is out of balance? It's, it's a little hard because one of the things that happens, and I've talked about this in the podcast before, but one of the things that happens is that our body is pretty genius. Our body and mind are pretty genius. And if we are running on stress day after day after day after day, it just assumes we can't get away from it. So it's, you know, our body mind is seeing our life, our chronic stress as a big, bad bear in the forest, and it's not going anywhere and it never changes day to day. So the ingenious of the brain is that it will go into this state that we call clinically dissociation. And what does that mean? What it means is that because your body can't separate itself from this chronic stress, the rest of you separates from your body in a way. You get in your head, you get separated from your emotional feelings, separated from your physical feelings. Um, it's not like literal, like I'm numb and I can't touch and feel my body, but it's more like I could run on empty forever and not realize I'm running on empty. 
it's pretty fantastic what the brain can do. It really can elude us into believing that we are okay. We're just fine. We can run on chronic stress. No big deal. This is just life. Just add another thing. Woohoo. Well, let's do this. And the only time that you really start to see that that's the problem is when it gets interrupted. And an interruption can be a lot of different things, right? It sometimes happens in the form of you're, you've planned some time away. You've planned some time away. You want to get some rest. You want to take that spring break vacation. It's, you know, mid-April here. And so, <laughs> you know, people are showing their pictures on social media and you're like, oh, I want to go do that too. And then you get there and you're just dead or you're sick or even worse, here's one that shows up for women. We get restless. You know, there's nothing planned on the vacation. Well, uh -huh, ah, how can you not have things planned? If one of your compensating behaviors in your chronically stressful life is to always have a plan and a to-do list to do, that could also show up in those moments. And all of these things are big red flags that things are out of balance. Now, if you know me at all, you've been listening to me at all, you know I am not a math person, <laughs> but this does actually come down to just some simple math. If what you're putting in is not going to give you what you're needing when you are doing all the things in your life, you'll get depleted, end of story. But not every self-care is made equal. And so there is this idea that if you start to reinvest in yourself, that you're going to start to notice that, it, you know, it doesn't take a ton of self-care. It doesn't mean that eight hours of work equals eight hours of self-care. It means eight hours of work equals I'm going to have to offset that with some self-care, but some self-care doesn't take all that much time. And there's one form of self-care that's really quite simple. Now, for those of you that aren't parents, this metaphor is about, you know, parent-child, but it's a really great example of how this shows up in our lives. So, you know, think about other people or little animals in your life that depend on you. But essentially, you know, a parent is not just parenting when they're directly doing something, right? You, you know, little Jane, little Joey, you might need to sit them down and you know, we're not supposed to do this. You need to do this. There are those moments, right? There are the moments where we're pushing them on the back of their bike, trying to get them to pedal things. So there's times where we're doing direct parenting, but there's also all this other time where they're watching us. And let me just tell you, friends, they're all watching us and they see things. And so a lot of what little Jane and Joey are seeing in their life, in their lifetime, is how their parents are interacting in their world. And that's the stuff that really starts to make those ingrained social conditioning, family conditioning kind of things, kind of rules that they're going to follow for the rest of their life. Well, I'm here to tell you that you are watching you too. And I know that sounds strange, but let's just, just go with me for a minute. If you're in this chronic state of stress most of the time, right? And your body does what we know neurobiologically it's going to do. It dissociates. So it lets you overwork and stay on autopilot and, you know, go way beyond the 300 miles worth of gas you have in the tank. You just keep going. If you're in that state then you're kind of separating yourself from some of the parts of you that know that you're, you're working too hard. Like, let's say our bodies. Our bodies really know that we're working too hard and they get tired and they get painful and they get stomach aches and they get headaches. Uh, any of this sound familiar? When we're in chronic stress, when we're doing too much, our body does kind of kick up and tells us that. We're not always paying attention to that, but it certainly does kick up and tells us that. But there's these aspects of us that, that want to do best. You know, we want to be in alignment with our purpose and, you know, make a mark, you know, leave a legacy in this world. We don't want to just show up, punch in, punch out, especially when you get to this stage of life. When you are in somewhere in the neighborhood between 35 and 65, the kinds of choices you're making aren't things that are like, this is a joy ride. Let's, you know, I only live once. There's 
maybe some of that in there, but a lot of those decisions are wrapped around, I want to leave the world a little bit better than the way I found it. I want to make sure that the version of the world that I put out there, that I create for my people and my tribe around me, that it has meaning. And in those kinds of decisions, we are finding ourselves putting in way more than we have to give. And yet we're not replenishing in the way that we need to. And what happens over time is that, you know, that good little girl that wants, wants that gold star, I'm doing the legacy, I'm doing the right thing in the world, that she's watching you overwork yourself and she's learning from you on the inside. This is you looking at you, by the way, but this aspect of you is watching and seeing this and saying, oh, I guess that's the only way to do this. Just like little Jane and Joey, just like our kids watching us and picking up way more on what we do than necessarily what we say or intervene directly on. We're watching ourselves do this and we're believing our own BS. We're believing that we have to keep putting in and have to keep putting in. And this kind of entrenches us in that cycle. So I had this experience once where it was early in uh, starting my own private practice and everybody knows starting a new business, not an easy task to do. So early on in my starting that new private practice, I, um, I just realized I hadn't taken any time off. That's really what it was. Like the thing about working for yourself is nobody's giving you sick time or PTO. As it turns out, <laughs> you go to work, you get paid. You don't go to work, you don't get paid. So uh, yeah. So I just, you know, coming out of a, a, an environment where I had been in salaries and benefits and all those things for years and years and years, this is a new world for me. And I was getting tired. And if I'm noticing I'm getting tired, then something's up because I don't normally notice, right? I'm normally in that dissociated state. So if I was noticing it, I was like, what's happening? And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I think it's been almost two years since I took any time off for myself, like actual time off for myself. And I should say that in this time frame, there was this other job that I have that is a teaching job. And the way that it works is, you know, I fly out to a location, I teach somewhere in the neighborhood of about five to seven days in a row. And we usually do them across the weekends because, you know, I'm teaching adults and other adults have jobs. And so in order for all of us to preserve enough of our work time, we uh, teach over the weekend. And what I really wasn't noticing is that I was doing that every couple months, three months, and I wasn't taking time off. And so every couple of months I was working like for two weeks straight for a good 14 to 16 days straight, not a day off. And I was working every day and not taking any time off. Now I'm not unique. Uh, I know lots of people that, uh, that find themselves in this predicament, but what I noticed is I was getting tired and I thought, okay, I'm going to plan time off. So I looked at my calendar and I, you know, reconfigured all of my clients. So I wasn't losing, you know, too much time, <laughs> too much money. <laughs> um, and I, you know, put them on different days on the front end and the back end, you know, like before I leave and when I get back. And I found a good like whole week long that I could take off, whole chunk of time that I could take off. Okay, great, awesome. And what I started to notice was as this time kept getting closer that I was going to take off, I had started a to-do list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did. I started a to-do list of like, I'm going to, I need to refinish that piece of furniture and this room needs to get painted. And you know what? I'm still behind on billing. So if I'm not working, what I really should do is catch up on billing. So by the time I go back to work, then I'm all good. I had the to-do list of, you know, all massive proportions by the time I reached the time for this, this time off for me to rest. And what actually ended up happening was this, my friends, the first night I was home by myself, didn't have the kids. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to give myself two nights to just do whatever. So I sat down on the couch, turned on me some Netflix and I had some sweatpants on and you know, the rest of this story, right? So I really got into a series. And then of course I woke up the next day and I was like, well, maybe I'll just watch a couple more of those. And you know, the rest is history. You have 
you have now binge watched an entire series of some kind and lost several hours of your life and a few days possibly. And that is really what happened on the front end of this. And so then on the back end of that week, I was panicked that I hadn't done all these things. And I was self-critical and that inner mean girl was super awful to me about, see, you just you just took that time, you're so selfish. And now we're not gonna get all this stuff done. Listen, people, by the time I got back to work the following week, I was worse for the wear, not better. I was worse for the wear. Now, if there has ever been a red flag, this is the red flag of all flags. I took time off and felt worse after. And I'm not the first one that has uttered that sentence. And I'm betting you too have uttered that sentence. This is a real good indication that things are severely out of whack in your life, out of balance in your life. But remember that not all self-care is made equal. And so it doesn't mean that you're going to have to necessarily take off another enough time or take, you know, do the right kind of self-care work for yourself. All this means is that you need to take a good hard look at how much output you're putting out there and how much input that you actually need, right? So fast forward a few years, and this was just last spring. It was just a year ago, actually. And I, uh, I, I think it was really around this time. So April, May, May, I bet it was May. I was approaching my son's graduation from high school and I was, you know, thinking about those kinds of things, but I was still working, you know, all of my jobs. I I think I was just reflecting on like, I had, I needed to get his cards out and I needed to do a few things. So um, I thought, you know what, I haven't planned to take this time off, but I'm just going to do it next week. So I started talking to every client I had. That was an every week client. And we, you know, said, listen, next week, not going to be around. I moved the every other people, that kind of thing. So I moved my schedule, had the whole week off. And I realized that my habit showed up of let's create this to-do list of all the things we need to do. And I started to do that. But I saw myself doing it this time. I mean, we're talking about I've advanced a few years and I've actually caught myself in these patterns and I am trying to bring more back. And what I recognized is that I had heard the call earlier of that, you know, those aspects of me that know that they're just drowning in there. I had heard that call and I had honored it and I had taken the time off. And then when I was looking at a to-do list and I heard the inner mean girl want to show up and tell me I better get into shape. She's got her whip. Then I noticed this is an old habit of mine is to take time off to catch up on all the other things when actually what my body and mind need from me right now is to do absolutely nothing. And that's what I did. My friends, I, I didn't plan anything, any of those days. I was a little restless on the front end because I I just disclosed, I'm usually working three jobs all the time. So it wasn't like (laughs) this was, this is odd for me. This is uncomfortable for me, but I was listening to what my body and mind said And in doing that, it was altering. It was life altering for me. And I'll tell you why, because that part of me that has watched me all this time overwork us, saw it and thought, this is different. She's doing something that we have not done before. And I started to have an inner dialogue with myself about if I feel like I need time off, what I need is time off. And if not everything is done, it doesn't mean I'm broken. It means the system of all the things I'm trying to get is broken. This is not working for us, right? All of a sudden, it became really obvious to me that time is just a container. That's it. It's a container. And if you're trying to shove too many things in a container, is it the problem of the container or is it the problem of you're trying to shove too many things in it? Right. And I realized, you know, because I try to practice what I preach, I realized that I had my habit of putting others first and people pleasing from my youth was creeping in in this weird way where I just felt like I had to be a human doer doing the things all the time. And that if it sounded like something that I could accomplish, I should be able to say yes to it and fit it in. 
And I wasn't able to fit everything in because the container of time just wouldn't allow for it. So this was not a problem of I, I'm not competent. It wasn't a problem of I'm not doing the right things here. It was a problem of I'm doing too many things. And I'm going to have to sit down and have some hard conversations with myself about what gets cut. And that, my friends, started the journey. I, I even think I wrote some um, blogs. So if you go to my blogs from last spring, you'll see that I was starting to kind of reflect on I need to change something, like significantly change something. And what followed was about a month later, starting conversations with all of my clients that I was going to put more time into my coaching business, learn to love your story. I was going to have to take time away from my other private practice and reorganize how much time that I had for myself. Because ultimately, if the container is this small of 24 seven, you know, if it's only 24 hours and I have to be sleeping eight to nine and there are certain things that need to get done. And I only have this much left over. I, I'm going to, one of my areas of self-care now is going to be to really preserve that time for me and, and to have a life or design a life that feels compatible with the size of my container. I might be disappointed, my friends, and I was. In some ways, I had to say goodbye to things I did not want to say goodbye to, right? But I knew that if I said goodbye to those things and I was being more appropriate with what, what I could fit into my container, that I was going to feel better. And that is what it took for me to start to see a little bit more of this balance in my life. Now, I said at the very beginning that I don't like to call it balance, and here's why. I don't think that it's equal to equal, which I mentioned, but I also don't think that this is a game of there's, you know, yuck and there's good, you know, there's not good work, all the things, adulting, and then there's good, the self-care and the things. I think what we're trying to do is to integrate. We are trying to weave together and design a life that has all the aspects of it that we want in this container, but it all fits nice and neat into the container of time that we have. My friends, part of what has been such a bad raw deal that we've gotten as women in this world is that we've been handed way too much for the allotted amount of time and resource that we have. And while we all logically can sit down and, and shake our heads and say, yep, that's right. Uh-huh. She's right. We're not doing anything to affect that change. And we have to, because nobody's coming in on a white horse to save us from this. We're going to have to make hard decisions and life transitions like midlife. There's really no better time to, to take real inventory of your life to look at where you want to be spending time and where time is spent that you don't want to really ever be there and ask yourself questions about, does this serve me? And what would better serve me? And how do I get there? And it might not mean that today you will get there. I, I made decisions last May and June that didn't take effect until this past January. You know, I made decisions that I was going to start to back off from a business that I had built over, you know, four or five years. So clearly that wasn't going to just go away overnight, but I was going to do it. And, and what it meant was I really had to stay fixed on this idea that I am going to better, you know, put into this container what the container can hold and be discerning and make the tough choices about what goes in and what doesn't go in. Because if I don't do it, my life starts doing it for me. Uh, essentially, the container that can't hold everything is just going to let stuff fall out. And really, all that falls out is whatever you tried to stuff in there last. And you are usually the one you try to stuff in there last. So this comes all the way full circle to this idea of self-care. Because I think... One of the ways in which we sabotage our own self-care is we're adding it to the already too many things in the container. And then, you know, you take that time off, but it's really not going to stick. It's not going to do anything for you. you you're not going to get any usefulness out of anything, any time off, anything for yourself, a massage, none of it. If it's on top of things that are already falling out of that container that you have, that, that amount of time and resource that you have. 
So what I'm going to suggest that we do, and I'm not thinking that this happens overnight for any of us, and I'm not thinking that it's something that happens and it's a done, like you do it and then you're done. I think this is a, a commitment to ourselves, to those parts of us that are watching us and seeing, does she really care about us at all? She just kind of put us through all this stuff. Oh, I don't think I can handle any more of the overworking. It's, it's our commitment to ourselves to really start to discern what should stay and what should go, what can fit in my container and make me feel good about my life and still in alignment with what my purpose is and what is just not going to make the cut, even though it was a really good thing. And I would love in another lifetime to have had the time for it. But in this lifetime, this is all the time I have. Here's what I'm going to suggest you do. It's a very simple principle. Put yourself first. Don't roll your eyes at me. Selfish. I know you're here. I hear all of it. I hear the social conditioning, but I'm going to tell you that selfish is the new selfless. So if you actually want to feel like you are giving to the people that you love, which is a traditionally what we think when we say the word selfless, you better stop giving them garbage. I'm going to say it again. You better stop giving them garbage. You need to love you first in order to be able to love them. You need to nourish yourself first in order for you to nourish them. You need to respect yourself first in order for you to respect them and so on and so forth, right? It makes sense logically, and it probably makes your stomach just a little rumbly as I say this, because it will go against the grain of what you've learned across your lifetime, which is actually my worthiness comes from how much I give to everyone else and self-sacrifice. But now I want you to think about that word selfless. I think when we're acting selflessly, what we're really doing is having less of ourself in this world. And that's less of ourself for anybody at all, not just for us, less of ourselves for us. There's less of us to go around for people that we work with, people that we you know, take care of, people that are in our families, our friends, all of it. If you're always putting everything before you and stuffing it down in that container and hoping to God, it's not going to come out. And then when I say something about self-care last week and you get your little self-care cheat sheet, you're like, I'm going to do these things, but you're trying to put it on top of this container that is already overflowing. You have already set the stage for this isn't going to work. So unless you actually do this inverted principle of I put me before everything else in every single question, Natalie, can you do this for your daughter? Can you volunteer at this thing? I have to ask myself, Natalie, have you done what you need for you in order to do that? And if you say yes to that, okay, are you going to be able to continue to do what you need to do for you and still do this? If you get a no for either of those questions, it's a no. And it doesn't mean it isn't a really great thing that you were just saying no to. Volunteering to you know, do something with your kids is usually a really wonderful thing for parents. But it's not going to work if your life can't fit it into your container. There might be some things early, you know, like that you've shoved into the bottom of that container, some things that you take for granted that you just do because you do that also, you might want to really start to unpack some of this container and start to take a look at it. There's some things that we do every single day, all the time. We just take it for granted that this is like, we're supposed to do it. So we don't ask for help. We don't assume that anybody will come help. And you need to start looking at those. So ladies, I am talking to those of you that have a household with other individuals that are able-bodied and could be helping in the household chores, in any of the things that you feel like you're overwhelmed with at home because it isn't integrating well with your work life and your other life. Uh, you need to be asking those able-bodied humans, even the ones that are minors in your home, to be doing things. And that's the first part, okay? Then you need to let them do it their way. You may give them suggestions, but you better not start nagging 
or self-critically judging what they've done as not as much as what you would do, or they will stop doing it. It is, it will be self-defeating. You're asking them to do something and you're really just setting it up so that you're for sure going to have to do it if you're going to be critical of them. So there's, a, it's a, it's a twofer. You're not just inverting. You're not just asking for help and taking one of these things out of your container. You also are going to have to uh, hold this boundary for yourself that you're not going to just let your mouth fly, that the laundry wasn't folded as well as you would have liked it. Was the laundry folded? Was it in a cupboard or a drawer? Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. Was it in the basket? Okay. I mean, yes, I would like it to go from the basket into the actual drawers. Okay. Did the drawer get shut? Who cares? Is it in your room? I don't care. It, your things, yes, you can keep them very, very neat. Don't worry about the, the caliber of the work that others are doing because it isn't a reflection on you. And actually, part of our self-critical nature or critical nature to them, judgmental nature to these people and how they're doing this work for us, uh, it, it, it honestly is just habit. It's a habit of my worthiness comes from how well I do it. And if it doesn't look good, then I can't feel good. And now your brain has just taken the last sentence. If it doesn't look good, I don't feel good. It, it's forgotten that it created that belief system based on the fact that originally it was my worthiness comes from how well I do things in this world and I better do it perfect and I better stay on top of it. So don't hold them to the standard that it never should have been held to you and you never, and that you never should have had to hold yourself to over this time. Making sense? All right. So self-care doesn't always balance with our, how many things we have in our life. That is true. We want to integrate it into our life. And the way that I'm asking you to do that is by inverting what you're doing right now. Instead of putting yourself at the end of your list or adding this stuff on like it's an extra, I am asking, I am imploring you to put yourself first and preserve the vessel that goes out into the world and does all the things that you do. And I promise you, here is where you're going to see that it isn't a tit for tat balance. If you start to put yourself first, the parts of you that have felt neglected all this time will show up for you. They'll be like, no, she, yeah, no, we're being put first all the time. Like, yes, let's put some, I got a little bit more pep in my step. I want to do this. It does, it's not a ledger in the way that we think. Eight hours of work equals eight hours of self-care. Nope. But if every day the first person that you take care of is you, literally, then every day yourself is watching you prioritize you for before all of these other things. That's a big deal. That pays dividends on the other side. People invest in people that invest in them, right? Who are the people you would call at 3 a.m.? It's the kind of people that, that go the extra mile in your life. If you are one of the people going an extra mile every single day by putting yourself first, what it means is when you need to dig deep, when there really is not enough resource or time, but you're going to have to do a thing anyway, your body and mind is ready to give that to you. Now they're going to compensate and need to rest and do some self-care afterwards. But man, if you run up against a real pickle, but you've been investing in yourself by putting yourself first and making sure your self-care is in check before anything else goes into this container of yours, all of a sudden the container gets a little bigger. The capacity gets a little bigger. It, it, you know, the investment and the faith in yourself gets a little bigger and it makes a huge difference on the other side of this. Now, again, not an overnight success, not gonna be something that you do and then you figured it out and you're done with. This is a process, this is a lifelong commitment, but I implore you, make this commitment for yourself. It is one of the most valuable ways to help you learn to love your story.